My name is Todd Lohr. I'm a senior geological engineer at the Army Corps Risk Management Center located in uh, Lakewood, Colorado. And I'm here to give a give the presentation for best practice chapter D7, which is the concrete dam foundation risks. So what we're trying to cover are what are the primary risk driving failure modes that we find for concrete dams? What's the information needed to support that risk assessment? And it's primarily focused on the foundation. So not within, not internal to the dam, not gates, anything like that. Foundation, failure risk for concrete structures. Here's the outline for chapter D7. We have summary of the primary geotechnical and foundation related failure modes. We'll put this in a historical perspective for how concrete structures have performed. We'll do a quick case history from a concrete dam failure, and then we'll get into the foundation considerations, discontinuity and associated PFMs, discontinuity shear strength. We'll talk about foundation uplift pressures and forces and um, rock mass modulus and loading considerations. We'll discuss briefly like multi-block systems and multi-block stability analyses. And then we'll summarize with some key take-home points for, uh, for performing a risk assessment for a concrete structure. All right, some key geotechnical PFMs. First one, first category is, is under stability, where we can have sliding along weak planes in the foundation or at the concrete rock contact. These can be seismic or dynamic. We can also have adversely oriented discontinuities, which form a rock wedge that's that's what's called removable. It can displace in the dam foundation and it can result in cracking and severe distress to the structure. We can also have failure through the abutment rock mass. That's like a global stability, global failure through a fractured rock mass in the abutment or deeper in the foundation. We can have irregular or differential settlement or deformation that leads to increasing stress concentrations, which increase the structural capacity of the of the concrete. Those also result in cracking and then leakage and then and then failure. And then we can have issues resulting from failed drains or no drains at all. Um, or we can have poorly performing or get plugged drains, which change or increase the uplift conditions in the foundation. We need to understand and uh, characterize that for during the during the risk assessment. And then the last one under stability might be related to solution features in soluble rock, uh, karstic features perhaps, or, or lava kind of tube sort of thing, where you have um, potential undermining or loss of bearing capacity. So those, those are the prime geotechnical parameters for, for failure modes uh, in the foundation related to stability, but we also can have erosion and scour uh, related to water flow. Um, this is covered in another best practice chapter that'll be talked, that will be um, presented later, but um, some of these erosion and scour issues might be undermining the structure from overtopping uh, and erosion of soil and rock in the abutments or undermining and headward uh, head cutting due to uh, the spillway failure or we can have blowout of the abutment rock due to maybe an overpressurized outlet works tunnel or pen stocks or, or leaking outlet works structure that pressurizes an abutment and can cause a failure. There's also perhaps a problem with respect to failure modes um, related to landsliding into the reservoir, either, either upstream of the dam that can result in a seash, or maybe there's deformations that can occur at the dam site causing structural damage and, and deformation. And this is also covered in another best practice chapter. So historical perspective on performance concrete dams um, following kind of the I cold summary from 1995. Overall, concrete structures perform very well uh, under all kinds of loading conditions. That's generally what we see. But, but based on the the data compiled by I cold, 
what we see is there's almost over half of the failures or incidences are, are associated with foundation issues. So failure through, in, or related to the foundation. But interesting, the other, some of the other failure modes, such as almost 10% for overtopping, might be related to rock scour and rock removability, remove rock removed from an abutment and undermining of the structure. We also have uh, uplift and uplift pressures are very much related to the performance of the efficiency of the foundations and the drains, which are what we also talk about when we're talking about foundation um, uh, failure modes. And the last one down here is uh, spillway failure. So almost 9% spillway failure. And that's probably also related to the rock scour and rock removal. So all these are somewhat related to some degree. There's a number of notable concrete dam foundation failures that uh, we should be, we should understand. Uh, we should understand the mechanics, the sequencing, the conditions, and the design, and why these structures all fail, because that tells us a lot about the project that we might be uh, investigating or studying, and it might help us put perspective on our assessment of, of risk and, and failure modes. Austin Dam in Texas, 1900, was a erosion of the toe of the foundation along a fault zone that caused slight rotation, downstream rotation, and the heel to crack, increased pore pressure, and it lifted and floated monoliths and carried them away. Bayless Dam is in Pennsylvania, and in 1911, this failed on a contact between shale and sandstone positioned about two feet below the foundation, and it had a also high uplift pressures and low shear strength and the the block of rock in that found in the horizontal bedding planes started to slide and displace and move and it cracked the dam and caused a failure this foundation was socketed into the rock perhaps two feet so it was a very very shallow foundation there's claims that uh, this was um, incredible malpractice and and criminal charges should have been brought on the owner because they made so many changes and and the the the, the designer went along with them even though he he knew better st francis is in california 1928 the abutment failed on on landslide features on uh, on schist out of slope dipping uh, schistos foundation rock um, there was lots of landslides in the region on that side of the valley that all had the same failure mechanism. It failed on these these oriented uh, tabular pieces of uh, of crystals that create the foliation plane, and it slipped and displaced into the dam at the foundation at the abutment and caused some, the whole structure to fail. Camara Dam is in Brazil, and it failed because of erosion and internal erosion of a of a weak clay filled shear that paralleled the slope and it was not removed in the foundation excavation so the the dam sat on rock with that with that planar feature sitting below it and it washed out material it plugged the drains increased uplift and as it eroded that material the, the dam foundation settled and caused that um, left abutment to to collapse and then Malpasay is, is the dam that we'll do a, a case history review on. So Malpasay is in dam in France. <laughs> it is a 218 foot high thin arch dam. It had no grouting in the abutments and it had no drain, under drain or foundation drain features. It was designed by Andre Cogne, who was a well-respected dam designer throughout the world at the time. And it filled very quickly. So the right abutment, uh, here's the geology. So the right abutment, which, which is not where the failure occurred, is um, founded on massive, competent granitic gneiss, hard, strong crystalline rock, fractured, but it, it was competent. The left abutment, though, was founded on fresh to altered and sheared and faulted schist. And like I mentioned previously, schist has a, uh, has a foliation structure within it that allowed oriented grains to create a plane of weakness and the faults exploited those features. So water tests showed both abutments to be tight 
the faults in the abutment were adversely striking to create a wedge. So we have what we have here is a photo of the left abutment after the failure. We have the uh, concrete thrust block in that upper area, and then we have we have a fault plane dipping sort of downstream, sort of a trending across canyon, but dipping downstream. We have another fault plane that's dipping slightly upstream, and together they form a perfect wedge. They form a mold that we're looking at right here. After it was all removed, we can see those features. So what happened was those ad adversely dipping faults and shears created a wedge in the foundation. During first loading, the, found, the, the, the structure put pressure on this upstream dipping foundation base plane and it tightened it up. It caused it to uh, reduce its permeability. While at the same time, it opened up the foliation shear plane on the upstream heel. So this brought full hydrostatic uplift underneath the entire rock wedge and it displaced probably not too far, inches to a couple feet, but that was enough to redistribute all the rocks, all the stresses within the concrete, crack it, fracture it, rotate parts of it, and it caused catastrophic um, collapse. So the main questions from Malpasse is, can a similar foundation deformation be triggered by, by high earthquake loading rather than just, uh, just rapid uh, reservoir loading? Can we trigger something like this from earthquake? Could this failure mechanism rupture through poor rock mass? Maybe you don't need just rock blocks and poorly oriented discontinuities. Maybe we can remove this thing through a fractured rock mass. And would the foundation drains have changed this result in any way if they've been able to drain the water out? Okay, so the first topic that we're going to cover related to foundation failure modes would be um, discontinuities. So joints, bedding plane, faults, shears, uh, foliations, anything that creates a weakened surface, a weakened planar surface is what we're concerned about when we talk about blocks and, and, and discontinuities. So the primary one with respect to rock wedge removability is, is similar to what we just talked about at Malpasse. We have a a potential geometry of sliding, which is called kinematic removability of a foundation rock block or wedge positioned in the foundation. This wedge geometry is formed by a number of discontinuities. We have to have a base plane that we slide on. We have to have a side plane that we slide along, and then we have to release off some surface back at the heel usually. So the continuity of these joints or combo combinations of joints is extremely important. And the line of intersection of the base and side plane needs to daylight in the downstream topography somewhere. That allows this wedge to kinematically displace outward and down, downstream in a downstream direction, causing distress and, and structural damage. The other considerations that we need to think about for this failure mode would be um, related to the loading vectors, static, hydraulic, seismic loading vectors that are applied onto the dam and onto that, that wedge relative to the sliding direction. We need to understand the shear strength, the C and the phi of the base and the side planes because those shear strengths need to be overcome by the, by the static, hydraulic, or seismic loading to have that block displaced. The configuration of the foundation is very important. How deep was it socketed into rock? Um, the deeper it is, the larger the rock wedge may form. So how deep, how deep and what was the foundation treatment? What was the foundation geometry relative to the top of rock topography on the downstream area? The downstream top rock topography is important because we need those planes to daylight. So depending on the topography, it may make the wedge smaller or larger. So all those factors come into play when we're looking at 
blocks that can displace and move in a foundation. So again, I've mentioned this previously, but construction photos are absolutely invaluable. You can glean and you can derive a lot of data, a lot of information, a lot of knowledge and spatial context for where rock blocks or poor rock or bad conditions may exist if you can filter through a lot of construction photos and delineate and annotate and communicate on these photos to your team members how and where and what sort of geometries are are present in the foundation. Another way to communicate the, the three dimensional conditions in the foundation are to put them on plan views and do them and plot them up on numbers of a number of sections so that you can hopefully communicate these things to other folks who don't have um, don't have that 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 geologic geotechnical background where they can visualize what is going on. So these are examples of of extracting that data and presenting it in a way that can be communicated and disseminated between the risk assessment team. This continuity shear strength is of course important because we have to exceed the shear strength on a block or on a discontinuity for it to displace and move. But Shear strength is, is a tricky thing to measure, mostly because we get small cores that are uh, at a relatively small scale compared to the size of the block that we're evaluating. So a number of years ago, Barton and Bandis tested large scale blocks and then they broke it up into sequentially smaller and smaller pieces. And what they found was that the smaller samples resulted in higher shear strength. So that means that there's some scale effects going on. So if we're testing the small scale samples and we're getting a shear strength from that sample, we might be overestimating the shear strength of that discontinuity. The reason is at the small scale, the, the smaller asperities and irregularities on that joint surface, they dominate the strength. But at a larger scale, the larger undulations and the larger scale asperities cause the cause the shear surface to ride up and above the small scale ones. So the small scale features don't necessarily um, contribute to the shear strength. So we've compensated for that by taking that sample and doing a saw cut. Right, we take a diamond saw and we cut it in half and we just slide those surfaces together. But what we found is that occasionally it's common that uh, the saw cut actually takes out the natural granularity and the natural bond between the, the features, the, between the you know upper and lower discontinuity surface. So the saw cut itself might actually underestimate basic friction angle. So we can compensate for this by trying to do tests on natural joints and we measured the small scale roughness, the tiny small scale dilation angle that we can measure horizontal and vertical displacements during the direct shear test. So we can take those small scale asperities out, get our natural, get our basic friction angle that is including the granularity of the surfaces, and then we add in the large scale, field scale roughness back in and that's measured on outcrop scale at you know tens to hundreds of feet. So that's a method that we can use to get more confidence in our in our direct in our shear strength parameters. Foundation uplift pressures are very important. They apply loads and uplift loads and adversely oriented loads to a, a block in the foundation and we need to account for those and and we need to also account for those just for just for sliding on the bedrock contact. So we need to gather data, analyze data, and present data that shows what is going on in the foundation relative to the uplift surface and the water pressures. So we do this by getting data from piezometers, from uplift cells, from weirs, from drains, and we compile it all. We measure it relative to tailwater and headwater. And we also try to develop potentiometric surface and contour plots to understand the groundwater condition and the abutments in the foundation. 
This takes evaluating the instrumentation and drains and plotting the most plotting the uplift curve relative to 100% uplift, the theoretical max. We project these relationships to both the tail, tailwater and the reservoir or tailwater and the reservoir elevations that we're concerned about. And then we also have to assess the submerged area of the block planes and evaluate total uplift. So Bureau of Reclamation did a study a while ago where they looked at eight of their concrete structures and they evaluated the drain efficiency and plotted it all here. This is what we're seeing. We're seeing all the data that's plotting up high are the data points from their study of eight dams. And what they saw and what they continue to use is is a base basically a two thirds or 66% drain efficiency that's observed in a majority of their inventory. So the caveat to this is that many, many bureau rec dams have not been fully loaded and have a long data history that includes high pools. Um, some other dams, maybe you are you might be working on a dam like that we have at the Army Corps where it may never have seen the, the high pools or even elevated pools. So what we end up having to do is take that data from the drains and the performance and project it forward to higher pools. And that's a little trickier and um, there's a little more error or uncertainty in, in that method. So we have to remember that there's there's conditional um, parameters that we that we have to account for. Um, another result of their assessment found that uh, drains should be about 40% the hydraulic height. So you can look at your drain, drain depth and drain profiles and uh, make sure that you're getting that that value, that the depth, because the depth really helps <laughs> helps with the you know uplift reduction. And drains must be cleaned and maintained. So what we're seeing here in this slide are plugged drains in a couple of the a couple of galleries where we can have iron oxide or calcium carbonate, manganese, um, manganese, magnesium, iron bacteria that form, and these can plug the drains and increase uplift significantly. So, so when you're prepping for a risk assessment, it might be very valuable to assess the history and result of drain cleaning, O&M activities, and what the results were from those from those studies and tests if they're available. This is a diagram showing basically before and after drains, before and after drain rehab, that in many cases you can get uh, improved or reduced uplift conditions if, if the drains are maintained. So this is emphasizing previous comment that for a risk assessment, understand the drain history and the drain um, operations and, and management. So grout effectiveness is often thought of contributing to the to the uplift reduction. But uh, if we think about it, the grout curtain goes in and dr drill holes and we pressurize an interval and that grout is going to go into the most permeable of the features that are in that interval being um, pressured, pressurized. So when we think of a grout curtain being a, a, a connected low permeable feature across the foundation, it's that may, that may be incorrect. The, the actual configuration of the grout is probably in the higher permeability features that were intersected and that there's potential for inter, for permeable features to never even have encountered grout or never even been uh, intersected by by drill holes. So so we have to assume that that's possible that almost up to 90 percent of underflow through the rock foundation might travel through less than 10 percent of the foundation discontinuities. So if we're counting on a grout curtain cutoff to reduce our uplift pressures, we've got to verify this with with measurements and with data and have confidence that the grout curtain is in fact reducing uplift. And remedial grouting may have occurred, but under a high reservoir head, a lot of times remedial grouting might actually get flushed downstream where it can cause a worse problem because it can set up 
downstream increasing or decreasing the permeability of the rock mass downstream, which is not usually what we, what we are wanting. Okay, rock mass considerations for failure modes. So rock mass, this parameter affects the structural deformation and load distribution. So the rock mass is defined as the intact rock broken up by various types of discontinuity. So how the magnitude of how much that rock is broken up by, by discontinuities affects its modulus, affects its shear strength, affects its permeability, affects a lot of aspects. So it's important to try to understand, at least for, for load distribution or settlement during earthquakes, what is the modulus of the foundation? And the foundation modulus is definitely not the intact modulus that we can measure in the laboratory. And it's probably not the small scale geophysical modulus that we get in a laboratory because the strain is too small. So rock mass classification systems are intended to be uh, used used by engineering geologists, geotechs, so that they can take the physical parameters, measurable parameters of the rock and of the geology and work through a system to get to a value of a rock mass rating, of a rock mass quality, of, of a geologic strength index. Those rock mass systems take the intact rock and then account for and adjust for the degree of fracturing, degree of fracture infilling, spacing, openness, all those sorts of things. So then we can basically downgrade the, rock, the intact rock strength or downgrade the intact rock modulus to be more reflective of what it will be on a larger scale. So the rock mass modulus is evaluated and we can derive empirical relationships that relate to modulus and shear strength. Uh, we can also use some in situ testing like 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 uh, pressure meters. We can use or help inform us with geophysics and we can uh, also calibrate to field measurements of, of actual deformation. So the, the rock mass modulus is is important because when we do a seismic analysis, the, con the structural engineers need to know what sort of deformations they can anticipate in the foundation. So as a as a geologist, we might think that, oh, a, 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 a weak, a low modulus might be more conservative, but it's actually not. It's the other way around. A stiffer foundation, so a higher modulus, is actually more conservative with respect to the structural response. The reason is as the as the earthquake shakes the dam, if you have if you have a weak or low modulus foundation, more energy gets dissipated into the foundation and then the structure can account for it more. So so when we have a stiff foundation, more of the seismic energy has to be accommodated in the concrete. So a low foundation modulus can over dampen the system and it is not a conservative estimate. So we have to remember that and then work with the structural engineers and have this discussion so that we are characterizing the rock mass accordingly so that the analysis and the assessment can be made for the risk assessment. And then uh, often we'll perform sensitivity analyses to uh, see what the difference is with respect to foundation loads and stress distributions. All right, so multi-block stability analysis systems. So typically what we do is we take a 2D slice and we break it into the multiple block foundation components and then we run a force balance stability analysis and it incorporates the dam footprint, maybe a stilling basin, anchors if if they go down below the, the wedge or the failure plane and then we have the active block on the left in the foundation and we have a passive wedge that's downstream so we so to force this block to move and slide we have to fail through potentially fail through intact rock or semi-intact rock in the passive wedge 
So unless the passive wedge is very thin or weak, shearing through it is, is generally considered unlikely. It's very difficult to rupture through this mass of intact rock, unless there is an adversely oriented discontinuity that, that forms that, that upward shear. The other thing is that we have shearing in between the active and the passive blocks that bring strength into the equation, which sometimes is difficult to account for. Uh, sometimes for multi-block analysis, a, a DDA type of assessment might be performed because we, we can bring in all these different geometric configurations that have different engineering properties. And um, it can maybe present a picture better for a complex multi-block system. 3D model construction is usually something that everybody likes to see. It's, it, they're cool, right? They're cool to build this 3D model that we can rotate, we can fly through it, we can bring the dam, we can bring the foundation, we can bring the topography, then we can put the geologic discontinuities or rock features in there, and we can build this and represent it, and maybe we can um, show our, our failure mode a lot better. But um, issue with these are, are that sometimes they're very time and money, um, draining. <laughs> they take a lot of time. They can cost a lot of money. Uh, these are primarily for visualization purposes. So we're showing people who have a hard time seeing things in a stereo net, hard time seeing things in 2D representation or on maps, um, how and where this block is positioned or, or adverse features are in the foundation. So you generally can't perform any analysis on, on these models. They um, they're for graphical representation. Maybe you can get areas of planes or volumes of block, but that's pretty much it. Oh, while they're hugely valuable to communicate, um, difficult to understand three-dimensional systems, they also can take a lot of time and money and effort to build. So another way to go about uh, a stability analysis in these scenarios is to uh, look at an uncoupled analysis. So uncoupled, we're just taking the loading from the dam, loading from the, uh, the, the each monolith, depending on where the a, a rock block may be. And we can do a vector and force strength balancing analysis in a spreadsheet. And then run it through a new mark analysis for the seismic loading vectors and get to a stability analysis, uh, a factor of safety. We can also use a program called, called RIGID, which was developed by Greg Scott, a bureau a bunch of years ago. Um, and this can build the actual physical foundation block. And again, we incorporate you know, information from the structural model as to what the loads are, but this can run those, those same analysis that are in the, in the vector spreadsheet program. And the last thing is a actual kinematic stereo net analysis can perform stability assessments if we know how to bring the vectors and the loads and the and the shear strengths into a, a, a stereo net. This can be kind of complicated. There's there's instructional manuals to, to follow, but it um, it can get us to a factor of safety reasonably well. All right, so nonlinear. So this is a bringing the dam and the loads and the foundation all together in the same model. These are un undertaken only if uncoupled analysis shows significant problems like large displacements, and we are significantly concerned that we have a failure that's related to a foundation issue. This is usually time consuming and expensive, requires thorough exercising and testing of the model. This is usually to re convince reviewers that the model's behaving right. There's a lot of skepticism apparently with, uh, with the non linear coupled analysis methods. So something else to consider though in the risk assessment evaluation is the three-dimensional components of the foundation dam system. So Dick Goodman, a couple years ago with some other folks from Bureau Rec, they did a physical model of the foundation at Folsom Dam. They modeled the, the rock surface under the dam from, from pre-existing detailed topo surveys, and then they poured blocks of concrete on there. And then they tried to slide individual sections or monoliths over the foundation. And they did things like 
like do one at a time, do two, do three, then they would hold it with rigid side pressure and lock it together. And what they found was a significant increase in, in overall shear strength because of the three-dimensional aspects of the, of, the, of the system. So their, their conclusions were that traditional limit equilibrium does not consider the 3D mechanisms between adjacent monoliths or within the foundation rock wedge. So some of their conclusions were that the shear strength and side friction of a monolith or, or components of the foundation might be as important engineering property as foundation shear strength in improving sliding resistance. Potential strengthening influences of the foundation deflection, like side to side and rotational movement between between monoliths and along the and on the foundation because of the irregular surface, are sufficient enough to warrant their explicit consideration in design and analysis of sliding stability of concrete structures. And the methodology and results that they found from their study are are a, applicable to a removal rock wedge that's in the foundation, but it needs to dilate, expand, and rotate, and have some three-dimensional effects that, that help stabilize it. So we can develop significant 3D asymmetry of rotation, torsion, dilation, interlocking between the concrete monoliths and within the foundation of the rock wedge or the rock nest. So we have to consider, is the three-dimensionality of the system sufficient enough that that 2D structural analysis um, might be underestimating the overall stability of the structure. <clears throat> so in summary, most historic concrete dam failures related to foundation deficiencies are related to inadequate foundation configuration, poor characterization and mis or mischaracterization, and um, lack of treatment or or design components. So that would be an example of that would be like lack of drains. No drains in the foundation might be a, a red flag. So foundation risk assessment requirements, understanding the geologic, geomechanical, geotechnical conditions, meaning the rock mass engineering properties, the joint continuity and orientation, rock wedge shapes, rock mass strength, we have to understand all those relative to the structural loading and the interactions of all the force that's placed on those on the foundation. Water pressures, discontinuity, orientation, and, and shear strength assessments all, all need to be evaluated and thought through and have data available for when we go into PFMA and to, to the risk assessment. We have to know a lot of this already. We can't generate this information during a risk assessment, it takes too long. So the 3D geologic site characterization is useful early in the risk assessment as well. So foundation analysis methods should start simple and then progress to more complex. First thing is to build a conceptual model of the foundation, rock mass, rock blocks, build it in, in, in cross sections, build it in plan view, couple things together, Data needs to be synthesized so that we can adequately portray the subsurface conditions during the risk assessment. If we do find that there's a potential for instability, maybe we move on to a more advanced uncoupled foundation system using rigid block and vector analysis. As a last resort, we would go to the coupled foundation analysis where we bring in the, the, the sophisticated and, and high cost uh, numerical analysis. So in summary, where kinematically possible failure modes are identified, additional strength, loading, and water pressure evaluation may be required for the risk assessment. So, so where, when we do have adverse conditions in the foundation, we need to spend more time early before the risk assessment to characterize those conditions so that when we get to the analysis and the PFMA description and the, the, the risk characterization, we have an informed set of information and we're working off of um, data that, that we can have some confidence in. 
So we also have to consider the three dimensionality effects that contribute to resistance, especially if the dam foundation wedge system has a, a decent foundation design. If it's been socketed into the rock mass uh, sufficiently, if it's founded on competent good material, if the designers were aware of or or recognize the issues with weak rock close to the foundation or topo surface. So we should consider those. And then maybe we don't consider those as, as significantly if we have a broad type structure founded on you know, weak horizontal bedding systems. So, so we have to think about the setting, think about the conditions, and then decide whether our, our analysis is, is appropriate. Uh, the risk assessment should incorporate the most realistic and most likely conditions of, of the site and also consider uncertainty and possible variations. So you, we should be prepared to discuss those and prepared with information that supports or, or, um, or, or to present that information. And again, be prepared with data, with information, with graphics, being able to communicate a conceptual model and have this prior to the risk assessment. We cannot be doing this work while we are sitting in eliciting or discussing the the, the failure modes. We need to know it and understand it prior to the risk assessment. <clears throat> 